Hi, I'm Justin McCoy. I'm here today to talk to you about deep learning as a service. And I think I'm going to talk to you about and show you how to train, evaluate, deploy deep learning models with cloud computing. All through API calls, which would make uh, sense to Python developers. So if there's only three things you take away today, I want it to be these three URL links. So if, if, nothing, if you want to leave and nothing else matters, these are the only three URL, URL links that I want you to walk away with. The first one is a uh, GitHub project that I'm going to walk through today uh, using IBM's uh, deep learning as a service to train, deploy, and evaluate, train, evaluate, and deploy a machine learning and deep learning model. The next is Fiddle, github.ibm.com, FFDL. It is the open source library and framework that IBM Watson's Deep Learning as a Service is built on. So this is the open source code. And developer.ibm.com, it's where we're sharing all of our um, GitHub projects and all the our examples of uh, open source projects we have at IBM. So today we're going to go through, uh, I want to like level set. Um, how many here, how many people here use deep learning? Or have used deep learning, do anything about it? So this is going to be, you know, one slide quick overview for you. I want to talk about some of the applications of deep learning. I want to talk about some deep learning tasks. You know, what are the tasks you have to perform in order to train and evaluate a deep learning model? I want to talk about the tools you use for training, evaluating, and deploying deep learning models. I want to talk about DLAS, which is our cloud-based deep learning as a service um, cloud platform that we have that uh, Fiddle, it's built on Fiddle. And then I'm going to walk through code to submit and monitor deep learning tasks using Python. <laughs> All right, so for those of you that aren't familiar with deep learning, uh, I want to catch everybody up. Uh, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. I'm assuming at PY Data, we are all familiar with machine learning. Uh, it is a field of building models to classify and make predictions by representation of data in successive layers with increasingly meaningful representation. That is, that is a mouthful. <laughs> um, we all know that training deep learning models, you're building a neural network. You're building layers of basically matrices and performing transformations on those matrices. Hopefully that, that all makes sense. I uh, just giving you an idea of where deep learning fits in. You have artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Deep learning is a very specialized version of machine learning. That is where you're building these complex layers of matrix transformations. Successively, meaningful layers of representation of data. I know that wasn't, you know, a, a really uh, technical dive into what deep learning is. But here are some of the applications of deep learning that you could use. Uh, we have semantic segmentation. So that is, I mean, we're the internet generation, so everything has to deal with cats. I think using cats is the best way of describing some of the applications of deep learning. Uh, you have classification and localization. That is, can we classify an object and we can show where an object is in an image? We have object detection, again, just showing where an object is in a detection, but in an image, but we can do it with multiple objects within a single image. The deep learning model for that is called YOLO. Has anyone heard of YOLO? Have you use YOLO? You only look once. Uh, you have image segmentation, which again, you can do that for multiple objects as well in a single pass. And again, we're showing dogs and cats. And I think it's just dogs and cats here. Other applications of deep learning, more of the um, modern stuff, I think that top row there is something that we all should be familiar with. Object detection, object segmentation. Um, the, next, the next part of it is Generative adversarial networks. Has anyone heard of your, or used or created a generative adversarial network? One person. Awesome. So I'm just showing here an example of a generative adversarial network. 
And that is a network that has learned to teach itself to create something new. You have a generator and an evaluator. You have two neural networks. And the evaluator is going through and saying, hey, is this picture of a bird, is, if I'm gonna generate a picture of a bird, is it actually a picture of a bird? If not, let's go back through, update the pixels of that generator, and then generate a new image of what it thinks is a bird, and then evaluate it. This particular example of a generative ad adversarial network is we're using text to produce images. So we've gone through and we've trained a model to, you know, based off of text, produce images that it thinks represent that text. Just some kind of high-level overview of applications of deep learning. For deep learning, there are, or for machine learning and deep learning, you have a few different types of roles or, you know, paths, right? You can use pre-trained AI uh, that is just calling a machine learning model that's a API endpoint today. It's like your speech-to-text APIs or your image classification APIs that currently exist. You could use transfer learning. So you could take a pre-trained model like ImageNet and you could rip off the, you know, the bottom layers of that ImageNet model, those, or those last few layers of the ImageNet model, retrain those weights for whatever your classification task is. In our case, uh, uh, image, classification, image classification task. And then you could use just that and train that model on your own domain data. That is transfer learning. Or you could go the whole custom route. You could design your entire deep learning neural network yourself. You could create or generate or find the data to train the neural network. And you could train that network from scratch, building those sub subsequent layers of increasingly more Sorry, would you mind holding the microphone? Yes, I will. <laughs> All right, so these are just some deep learning tasks that we currently work through. You know, you're using pre-trained AI, you're using transfer learning, or you're building a new neural network from scratch. So I really, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about some of the tools that are available today. If you are a, you, we have two different uh, user personas. Uh, that I'm showing here, we have our traditional uh, developers and data scientists and researchers. I think a lot of you fit into that space, right? You're working in Python, you're working with Jupyter Notebooks, you're working with RStudio, and you're de developing and designing your own machine learning algorithms. Or you have those uh, non-coder, clicker data scientists. That is probably your business analyst that's going through and using a visual tool in order to create and evaluate machine learning models without writing any code. And there are a few tools to do that. You have this uh, tool called SPSS Modeler, Neural Network Modeler. I know there are others. Does anyone use one of these today? So there are tools that you can just pass it data. Uh, you can identify the, the labels, and you can identify the feature. And it's going to go through, and it's going to train a uh, machine learning model for you. You won't have to write any code. It will do the data transformations for you to get the data under the right format. I mean, it's a really simple if you're going through and you just want to explore what's available or what is in that data. And then both, you know, the traditional non-coder data, non data scientist and your developer data scientist, once you've had a model, you've got to go through and you have to deploy it in production. So I want to talk, I want to spend a moment on this slide. I've attended a few of the talks and everyone's going through and they're using Jupyter, Network, Jupyter Notebooks to build and train their machine learning models. And I'm curious, are you running Jupyter Notebooks on your laptops? Do you have a Jupyter Notebook that's deployed in your company that you connect into remotely that's backed by some, some system? Lovely. You're running locally? Anybody else? Well, how are you running your Jupyter Notebook to your data science task today? Company server. You have a company server. And is that company server just a uh, Jupyter Notebook that you, have a, you run a kernel on, like a Python 3 kernel with all your specialized libraries deployed? 
virtual machine. So you're running it on a virtual machine? But, Dark. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's, you know, it's really complicated to go through and set up the environment to do machine learning. And really, I'm talking about deep learning tasks today. If I wanted to go and build a system from scratch, you know, I probably would need a Linux engineer, right? someone that could build a Linux system for me. And then I'm going to need someone that can move up the higher levels of complexity from that Linux system and maybe build out some virtual machines. So I'm using VM to abstract out the hardware that Linux is managing. If I'm running virtual machines, I'm either running virtual machines and Kubernetes on top or just you know, Linux with Kubernetes. Are these terms familiar, Kubernetes, virtual machines? Or is anyone going through and building out their, uh, like a deploying on Kubernetes, deploying their notebooks on Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a container management system. So uh, most of our Jupyter notebooks, or how I've used it, is deploying a Jupyter notebook within a container. And that container has all the libraries specified for my environment. If I wanted to use sklearn version 1.1, I know it's a much later version <laughs> than that, um, but, and I want to use my own company's specific libraries, I would, create a I would create a container to host all the libraries that I would, uh, all the libraries and then the kernels for my Jupyter Notebook. And then I could easily deploy and scale that out as more and more users in my company want to use uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So then it spins up more containers. Those containers are deployed on hardware. That hardware, you know, it's, it's hard to manage all those containers, especially if you're a large company. If you're a one or two person shop, it's, I would suggest you use cloud services from some um, But if you're managing this all for your company, you have to manage all the containers that support all the libraries across your, your entire, whatever everyone else needs. If you need um, Keras, or if you need TensorFlow, if you need Cafe, you have to build containers for those specific libraries. That's, I think it's really complicated to do because you need a, a wide range of domain expertise to even get started. I'd just like to throw out this slide of all the different libraries and frameworks to kind of showcase the complexity um, that we all depend on. So to abstract out from some of that complexity, there is a open source framework built by IBM that we actually base our deep learning framework upon, and that is Fiddle. It's Fabric for Deep Learning. And if you <laughs> The, one of the three links I wanted to share that were most important, right, are one of them was Fiddle, github.ibm.com forward slash FFDL. Uh, you should go out there and take a look at the library if you are building your own deep learning framework today, because it solves a lot of these complexities of managing that Kubernetes cluster, managing what containers have assigned GPUs. Managing all the libraries and the containers of the different libraries that are deployed across my Kubernetes cluster. And then it adds, it adds some special sauce. This managing of the um, you know, training models, training different experiments. And I'm going to talk about the different, ex why you need experiments. And then monitoring. How do I know when my uh, deep learning job has completed? Right. There's a research paper here I linked to. And then I also have a IBM.biz deploy fiddle. So um, I, want, I want to make it easy. We want to make it easy for people to get started with this tooling. So there is a, another GitHub project that goes through and describes in great detail how to deploy Fabric for Deep Learning on your own Kubernetes cluster, or on an Amazon Kubernetes cluster, or an IBM Kubernetes cluster, or a Google Kubernetes cluster. Let's see what else I have here. It includes tools for, again, monitoring your jobs, but it also allows you to 
visualize your jobs. And you know, how do I visualize if my, um, the models I've trained uh, are, are getting more accurate? You know, is the validation accuracy going up? Or is it, is it getting more accurate? Is the validation accuracy going down? I said only three links, but this is a fourth link. Um, I know, every, you know several of you said that you use uh, Jupyter installed locally or Jupyter installed uh, on your company's server. We have a tool at IBM called uh, Watson Studio. I actually think of it as our IDE for artificial intelligence. It's a fourth link, ibm.com, forward slash cloud, forward slash uh, Watson Studio. I'm actually, we're going to be using this today in my demonstration and in, in the example that I go through. Uh, we're only going to really be using the deep learning service. Again, the deep learning service is built on top of Fiddle. It has some additional functionality and is uh, available to you as a cloud-based service where you can just make API calls in order to use it. Watson Studio is a, a GUI built on top and brings together a lot of these, that tooling that I showed in the tools of the trade slide. In Watson Studio, uh, there's actually a service that I'm gonna use in my demo, and it's called the, I actually don't like the term Watson, but it's a machine learning service. And what this machine learning service does is it provides you GPU compute, you know, scalable GPU compute. It gives you distributed deep learning. So if I wanted to spread my uh, deep learning job across multiple GPUs, right, across multiple containers, it gives you distributed deep learning. You have a neural network modeler. I'm not gonna show that today because that's one of those visual clicker tools. Uh, maybe I'll show you what it, what it looks like, but it's not a, um, it's more of a point and click, a GUI tool in the web. You have model hosting. So what do I do when I train my deep neural network, my machine learning model? How do I put that model into production and consume it through an API endpoint? You can do that really simply with uh, just a few clicks of the mouse here in uh, Watson Studio. We can monitor the lineage. So if I trained a machine learning model, how do I know it's the most up-to-date model? How do I know when was the last time it was trained, um, what data it was linked to? So there is a tool to monitor the lineage of that model that I've trained and built in Watson Studio. There is uh, this concept of continuous learning. It's just a simple way of getting new data, training the model, reevaluating. Is it more? Is it more accurate or less accurate? If it's more accurate, just redeploy that model. We can automate that step and that process using continuous learning in Watson Machine, in the Watson Machine Learning Service. You have a visual model builder. So in addition to that neural network modeler where you're building those neural network layers with a point-and-click GUI interface, you could do the same thing with machine learning models. So you can build your transformation pipeline using a point-and-click interface versus a um, you know, writing code to, to, to make my pipeline. You could easily you know, download the core ML models. Um, it supports Jupyter Notebooks and what I'm most interested in is deep learning as a service. So what is deep learning as a service? All right, again, this is built on top of Fiddle. It is IBM's, it's an IBM product built on top of Fiddle, uh, part of a Watson Studio, our IDE for artificial intelligence. So as a user, I've gone through and I've trained, or I've gone through and I've designed a neural network. And I'm using, you know, let's say, Keras in my neural network design. Well, I would have to go through and find a container that supports Keras that's connected to a GPU in order to perform my training. Well, what if I wanted to train multiple versions of this neural network? I want to uh, do hyperparameter optimization. So 
change the number of, change the batch size that I'm training my network with. Train the, the size of the convolutional layer. Change the dropout rate. So, you know, deep learning is still this kind of, it's more of a art than a science. And, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's silly to say it's art than a science, but there is no best practice for designing your network. If there is a best network design, and you, you know of it, I'm very interested for whatever domain space that you know the best network design in. Um, so how do you go through and you find and train a model that is, is, is the most accurate? You go through and you submit multiple experiments. You, you build a neural network, you change these parameters, again, the dropout rate, the batch size, the uh, any, you know, like any of your optimizers, you can spot those out. And then you submit a job to retrain to this cluster of compute. This is that distributed deep learning built on top of Kubernetes. And what I'm showing here in the photo is a image of a person, me, submitting my Keras training job. And in my Keras training job, I have specified a variety of different hyperparameters. I'm changing the dropout rate, the simplest one here. Um, maybe changing batch size. And submitting that job to my cluster and having it process all those jobs in parallel. So this allows me to train and do those experiments in parallel and see the results back after, you know, after one day versus seven days. You know, if I have a deep learning job that takes one full day to train, I don't want to wait one day to look at the results and then submit another job, wait a day to get the results. I want to do this in parallel on a cluster. And behind the scenes, this is all a, again, this is Kubernetes containers and sitting in each of these containers are connected to GPUs. Question. Yep. Is there a current search functionality where you can set that off and have automatically run several jobs for primary tuning? Uh, yes. And the first link that I presented, um, pydata underscore deep learning, ibm.biz forward slash pydata underscore deep learning. There is an example of performing grid search on a, um, a really simple deep learning model. It's just doing fashion, it's doing clothing identification, clothing classification. Cool. All right. So. And I, I actually think random is better than grid search. Because grid, you have to do all the different uh, potential all options. Of parameters. Yeah. And they say that random might get 95% of the way there without having to go through the entire you know, space of options. That's the talk here at the conference, too. Oh, it is? Right? Yeah. I'll have to go to that. So, some of the interfaces we have to this deep learning framework. The same interfaces uh, we have to fiddle, right? So you have a API. I can go through and I can make API calls to submit my training jobs, to monitor my training jobs, uh, to deploy my models. I can use a command line interface to do the same thing. And this is really all just an abstraction of that base API. Now I'm going to walk through an example using the Python SDK in order to submit uh, your model, tune your hyperparameters, and evaluate your model. And then you have a GUI. And I'm actually showing here the GUI from the Watson uh, Studio. And here is the neural network modeler. So if I wanted to just go through and click and design my neural network with all the convolutional layers and design the hyperparameters without writing any code, I can do that here in this visual model modeler. And then if I wanted to see, just again through the GUI, what it looks like for, you know, to compare all of my training runs, to compare all of my experiments across all the hyperparameters, I could use this um, the visual tool here to show, a, you know, the graph of the loss and the <coughs> graph of the validation accuracy. It's being hidden behind the other image, and then show all the different training runs in my experiment. So I better get going on the actual coding part of this, right? 
Uh, so really, uh, I guess good timing. So how do you submit an experiment to a cluster of GPU-enabled nodes, monitor progress, evaluate results, download training models, and deploy the model into production all in Python? Let's go. I'm doing it in Python because PY data, right? Like, we've got to use Python. I could easily have come up here and just shown you the GUI interfaces, but Python is more interesting. So if I'm training a deep learning model, there are several tasks that I go through. You know, I design my neural network. I vary the options, my hyperparameters. I submit training jobs. And then I evaluate those training jobs. And this is all kind of encapsulated in Fiddle and Deep Learning as a Service as an experiment. And we're going to go through and we're going to perform tens or hundreds or thousands of experiments depending on my uh, parameter space. In order to do that, I break it down even further here. Submitting and monitoring Deep Learning task in Py Python. First, we're going to have to configure our setup. Then we're going to go through design, vary, train, evaluate, and then we're going to go through and publish. So let's look at some code. Um, I'm just showing here. I'll post a presentation online if you want to follow through. But you can also follow on the links that I shared at the beginning. I have to go and create two services. I can easily do this for an API call as well. But here are just quick ways of creating the machine learning service and all my training data and my results data in the cloud for all the experiments and training runs I run are stored in cloud object storage. Now I'm using our IBM's cloud object storage, but I could just as easily use S3. All right, these are the libraries. Um, there's a Python library, Watson Machine Learning Client. It's an SDK for the machine learning service. And then here's a, another GitHub repository uh, that is, it's unofficial but it's abstracting out even that Python SDK, so it makes it easier to submit, monitor, and train your jobs. So let's actually look. This shouldn't, this shouldn't be strange to anybody uh, that's familiar with deep learning. Uh, I'm going through here, and I'm building a sequential neural network. I've got 13 different layers, um, resulting in a categorization of 10 classes, right? Is, Everyone seen or built a sequential, has anyone built a sequential neural network before? Okay, so this should look very familiar, right? This is like your hello world of deep learning. Well, in order to change this hello world of deep learning um, to, to work in the deep learning as a service environment, to work in the fiddle environment, we have to change just a few things, All right? Since we're storing our data in cloud object storage, we have to set the data directory where we're going to get our data from, and that's going to be an environmental variable. And then we have to set our log directory where we want our logs to go, and we have to set our results directory where we want our results to go. And since we're using cloud object storage, this is all just going to be thrown into buckets, right? So you're going to have a, a bucket with all my training data, a bucket with my log data, and a bucket with my results data, which includes my uh, trained model. So next, here is that same hello world of machine learning, that same hello world neural network. But I'm going to do some hyperparameter tuning. So I have a helper function, hyperparameters, that is loading a dictionary of parameters from a config.json file. And these hyperparameters you can see here, I'm specifying number of filters, filter size, different filter sizes, um, pool sizes, dropout, you know, dropout values. So there's a, a huge, you know, um, like a huge space, a huge matrix of different combinations that we could build. And we could run a grid search or we could run a random search to find out what combinations of these hyperparameters trains the best model. But that's going to take you know, tens or hundreds of different training jobs in order to find and train the most accurate model. You could also use these hyperparameters in um, for like batch size and number of epochs, wherever you want. So I've gone through and I've 
rewritten my hello world of neural networks. And I've added my hyperparameter tuning feature set to it. I just want to go through and package up that experiment in my hyperparameters helper function into a, a zip file. So once I, I have a zip file, I want to use this. Uh, I've, I've got my, I've designed my neural network. I now want to go through and begin the process of submitting that neural network, submitting it across all the different hyperparameter spaces that are, that are available. Just showing here some of the helper utilities that are in the example project I shared. All right, I'm using uh, Watson uh, Studio Utilities to configure access uh, with Python to my cloud object storage and to the Watson Machine Learning Service. And I'm using this project utilities to create a new project where I'm going to keep my experiments and training runs and monitor and manage those. I've got 10 more minutes. <laughs> I'll save five minutes for questions. So I'll go really fast through this piece. Here is a, in my project utilities um, method here, I have, or um, class, I have a method to simplify uploading training data to cloud object storage. Right, so I pass in my cloud object storage credentials. Um, to, it's just a, a JSON string. And then I can easily upload all of my training data to cloud object storage. The next is I want to design my experiment. Like the ex experiment includes all the different training runs that are available for uh, to do the comparison of my model, evaluate my model. I'm going to use a V100 GPU. I want to use it uh, distributed deep learning, so I'm going to use two V100 GPUs. I give it a custom name. I tell it the framework that I'm using. I'm going to use grid search. Um, and I'm passing in those studio utilities and project utilities that help uh, my experiment know where my data is. I have another helper function, again, in the sample project I shared, where it's uh, creating a, a random search. I guess I wasn't using grid search. I'm using random search. So it's going through and building random parameter spaces. Right? And it's saving that random parameter space to a config.json file. And then it's altering that zip file I have for my project with that specialized config.json file. Now I have a new, pro or a new experiment, I'm sorry, a new training run with a uh, config.json file with a wood one set of hyperparameters. And I submit that and execute that experiment. And then I loop through again and I generate another random config.json file. And I update the config.json file in my zip file. In my zip file, I package that up and I submit it as another experiment to my DLAS, my compute cluster. So it's going through and it's submitting multiple experiments using a random, you know, a random assortment of hyperparameters. Right, that's our hyperparameter optimization running in parallel on this distributed deep learning framework, or we could use Fiddle. I have another helper function here. It's called experiment, or it's a print experiment summary. So it's going to, through, it's going to go through and then just monitor those experiments that have been submitted, and then a print a summary of, of how they're doing. Is, are they completed running yet? So some of these experience, experiments, in the example, I think they take 20 minutes uh, per experiment, and you run them in parallel. You could do 30 experiments in 20 minutes. Um, you want to print a summary of all of those. I use TensorBoard when I want to evaluate. Um, so I, here's just the code I use in order to um, have TensorBoard point at my S3 bucket where my results are stored. Here's what it would look like if I was using Watson Studio and not using code. Again, that quick, clicky, click-through interface. And I've also kind of uh, simplified that deployment 
uh, saving and deploying of the model by abstracting out uh, the, the many API calls that are needed in order to do that as these save and deploy model Python functions. Okay, I went through that kind of quickly, but all the source code that you saw here is in a GitHub project. It's pydata underscore deep learning. And that's it. I'm Justin McCoy. I've got probably four minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Other than for parameter search, how do you utilize your multiple GPU? Other than parameter search, how do I utilize my multiple GPUs? Well, if I was running a large data science team, I would, each person that's submitting jobs would, you know, that, that GPU farm would be utilized by all the different members of my team performing experiments. What I mean is if you, you, can, do, you can train a single model on multiple GPUs, but that's usually complicated. Do you have support for that? Distributed learning does that. Right. It's built into Fiddle. I don't know how they do it, but it is open source, so you could go check it out. Yeah, it's also for trying to analyze how much time it would take to run your algorithm, then you might want to know, maybe not the implementation, but some benchmark of how the GPUs would affect it, since it's built in and it automatically uh, runs processes as the IPC. The, Does that make sense? So you're asking if... Would you, is there some documentation with benchmarks to say how much so the question is, how much does running uh, across multiple GPUs increase performance? So if I continually add GPUs to my, um, to my configuration, will that linearly scale performance? Um, if I... Well, not necessarily linearly, but, you know... But there is a research paper from IBM that they've been able to achieve... 95% uh, linear scale when attaching GPUs in a, a network cluster. So they added 256 GPUs, um, and they received, they were able to um, scale with a 95% linear performance. And I could give you information about that if you want. I'll take your word. 95%. That sounds good. Any other questions? If you download the code and you run into any questions, or if you have any problems, you could reach out to me on via email or Twitter. Interested to hear what you're building. Thanks.